I noticed in uh, Hudson's bulletin uh, announcing this event that, that uh, I'm described as not shy about telling my party what it needs to do. Well, I am shy. Uh, I think we all need to be uh, a little self-effacing about uh, a problem as uh, large and complex as the one we're here gathered here to discuss. And I've ducked a lot of opportunities to uh, mouth off about it. But uh, given my affection and loyalty to the two organizations which brought us together, I couldn't say no. I'm really privileged. Uh, I'll go anywhere for, for either the good people of Hudson or, or those of the Bradley Foundation. I think we're here because we're all uh, stunned and concerned by uh, what I've come to think of as the shock and awe statism that we've experienced just really within the last few months. And the reason I think that image came to mind was that, as I see it, there's what might one might call an audacious uh, endeavor to overwhelm the defenses of freedom and free institutions before they have a chance to regroup and organize themselves. We worry that there will be a leftward ratchet, which we've sometimes seen in human affairs, that those things that are put in place that add to the power of the state, diminish the sphere of the individual, will, we fear, prove irreversible. I want to say that with Paul, I am neither fatalistic nor pessimistic about the prospects. Um, I'm a Presbyterian. We're supposed to be fatalistic. <laughs> Theologically, maybe. We'll only know when we know. But uh, my preacher used to say a Presbyterian is someone who falls down a flight of stairs and says, well, I'm glad I got that over with. <laughs> Well, maybe theologically, but not in human affairs, as has been proven over and over again. I don't, I don't come at this subject today that way. I don't come at it pessimistically either. When I step back, even from the shock of current events, and ask myself again, um, and, and Arthur's uh, data just pointed us somewhat in this direction, uh, are Americans suddenly predisposed to forfeit hard-fought, hard-earned, um, uh, liberties that have proven themselves over and over again? I don't see it. I can make the opposite case. The best, the best educated people uh, ever on the planet, possessed of technology which empowers individuals in a way we've never seen before. George Gilder has been writing brilliantly about this for 20 plus years. Uh, still possessed of a healthy American suspicion of bigness, bigness in all its forms, big business, labor, and government. Uh, observing a federal government that's every bit as klutzy as it ever was and is dysfunctional, and just wait <laughs> until it tries so, some of what it's about to try. I think such a people are less likely and not more likely than ever before to be herded by, the, uh, by other uh, uh, omniscient uh, leaders into mass transit, smaller cars, labor unions, or homogenized health care. I think those who are trying to, uh, are going to try to squeeze Americans into these, um, coercively into these boxes, are, are the ones who are pushing water uphill. But still, the uh, topic with, uh, on which we're assembled uh, is a huge job. And so let me try to, uh, I can't uh, uh, sum for you better than Paul did, the uh, pillars on, on which uh, we stand, the uh, historical roots of our freedom. Let me try to uh, then to uh, uh, adapt my reflections in a, in a complementary way to his. I think the conservatism, if that's what we choose to call it, that will be credible um, in the uh, years ahead will be active, forward-looking, constructed, constructive, intimately connected with the lives of average citizens, and friendly. And let me just go through these contentions and try to illustrate briefly. Emerson once wrote that in every polity uh, there tends to always be a party of memory and a party of hope. And um, we must be, as we have been in our better days, our more successful days, the party of hope. And uh, someone once said conservatism is a democracy including the dead. Well, at least in my state, the dead are a reliably democratic constituency, so I don't, <laughs> I don't spend much time campaigning to them. 
But let me just say that, that that's, a, that's a wonderful <laughs> phrase when it expresses our reverence for tradition, our understanding and commitment to fundamental, timeless principles. But in terms of making our beliefs credible and successful and prevalent once again in this country, uh, our sights must be resolutely forward and to the future. I, I, in the days after VE Day, Lucian Trust got the... Uh, the, the the eminent general, World War II, gave an incredibly moving speech at the graveyard above the Anzio beachhead. And with respect to his audience, he turned his back on them and gave the entire speech to the crosses behind him. In my view, we must, with respect to um, um, other Americans, direct ourselves almost entirely to the young people of this country. When we speak to them, we are speaking to their parents and their grandparents who want the best for them. But I think that it is a starting point for our uh, recovery that we uh, examine every issue and present every issue in, in terms of its implications for those who will uh, soon inherit leadership in this country. I come from a state that's anomalous these days in that the uh, Republican Party, uh, for the last four years, after a long wilderness period, has been entrusted with leadership. In our state, we are, as I always define it, the party of purpose. We are the party that defines the agenda, uh, makes new proposals relentlessly, and then pursues them with, with uh, all the vigor we have. We are abetted by a, an opposition, which for the moment can only be described as reactionary, and it helps. Um, they are negative. They are backward-looking. They are bereft of new ideas. They are everything that we must not be as we address national events. And they're an object lesson to me. Now, one day they will recover their uh, footing and bring forward new ideas for my state. There'll probably be a change of leadership sometime. But for the moment, that's the state of play. We try to never be without an idea on the table. We try to never be without a major change underway. I love the story of Winston Churchill in his last days of public service, after the war, second tour as prime minister, in the fairly placid period of the 50s. And he goes to the office one morning, and the naval briefing officer says, uh, as he begins his presentation, says, uh, not really not much uh, to report this, this morning, Mr. Prime Minister. Nothing much is happening. And the 80-something-year-old Churchill said, well, then let's make something happen. <laughs> our presentation and our ideas must be born not in abstractions, but in an understanding and a connection, if we are to really present a people's agenda, we must not only assert, but assert with credibility that we understand what uh, is going on in the lives of everyday people. You know, empathy is going to get a bad name here for a little while if it's transported to the world of rule of law and legal jurisprudence. But empathy which is what Adam Smith was talking about in the theory of moral sentiments. It's what distinguishes our species from the others. The ability to put oneself in the place and to feel deeply about the concerns and the hopes and the dreams and the fears of other people is something that must be visibly a part of what we do. And I like meetings like this, been to a lot of them, uh, conferences. One of my friends described the, such things as the leisure of the theory class. <laughs> well, there's a place for that. But if we are to become credible, if, as Paul reminded us, if we are to achieve leadership through popular consent, we're going to have to earn it. And there's a special burden on us, let's just be honest. Um, again, I, we, we must never uh, uh, conflate conservatives and the Republican Party, but there's enough of an overlap that you'll know what I'm talking about. People who wear the uniform I do politically have a very special burden, which is not shared by our opposition. You can be a silver spoon, blue blood, um, windsurfing coastal elitist, but if you wear the Democratic label, you are presumed to be connected and empathetic and to understand the problems of everyday people and vice versa. Well, it's unfair, it's untrue, but it's reality. And it's realities we must deal with. I just 
I have spent the last six years traveling constantly the back roads and the inner cities of my state. I've stayed, uh, when I stayed overnight with the Alexander family in uh, Yorktown, an appropriate name for this, given this meeting, Yorktown, Indiana, just last Thursday night, it was probably the 80th or 85th time I've done this. Stayed with people of every description. I've traveled by recreational vehicle, 100,000 miles probably, and uh, many more on one of my two motorcycles. I've performed uh, impromptu weddings in bars. <laughs> and when I do this, I, I learn things and I'm able then to, I hope, to present and express ideas that you would find familiar, you would find animated by the principles of freedom, uh, in a language um, that maybe uh, it helps to bring uh, to us people who might not be reached at the level of ex abstraction. Um, I don't talk about, I don't use the D and the R word. I don't use the L and the C word. Uh, and I, don't, I don't talk about liberals and conservatives. It's, it's not a language I hear people using very often where I see them. But if you were to examine what we, have, what we do, when you, if you were to look at our health care plan for the uninsured, it is HSAs for low-income people. They are in total control of their health care and the dollars that pay for it. And they are proving to be the same good consumers that we always said people would be, if you trust them, if you believe that they have the um, judgment to look out for themselves. If you looked at our telecom uh, changes, uh, the most sweeping in America, yes, they're deregulation. I don't talk about that. I talk about how competition will lower cable rates. We it effected the largest, people will say, privatization in American history three years ago. I've never used the P word. To use it suggests that you started with a philosophical uh, uh, or an ideological purpose and then sh bent events to shape it. No. Um, we, get, we harvested close to $4 billion without raising, a, without a penny of taxes or a penny of borrowing. It's all being reinvested in the future of our state. Uh, a, a fabulous success, but we've presented it as a practical solution to a very real world problem the infrastructure shortfall shared by every state. You know, an idea or a would-be movement is only as good as the answers and eventually the results that it produces. A couple other thoughts. We must recover the high ground, the fiscal high ground, and it's available to us. Um, I tell you with um, certainty, um, and you don't need Arthur's data to tell you this, Concern about debt and deficit has not gone out of style, quite the contrary. Many Americans are more conscious of it today than they have probably been in a long time because they recognize it in their lives, or the lives of a neighbor, or the life of their, of some business they were associated with. People borrowed too much, spent too freely, saved too little, and are paying a serious consequence. You're seeing saving rates rise in America. That's a conservative virtue, don't forget. And I do believe that the terrifying deficits we are staring at now uh, proposed by this administration, everything Paul talked about, about the uh, worsening picture long term, the threat that poses to every young person in this country, presents an opening. Um, but, the, but let's face it, um, as a group of like-minded people, as a party, uh, a lot of credibility has been forfeited on that score in recent years. It won't return overnight. I think it will only return, by the way, if we're prepared to engage in some grown-up conversation. I'm not a seasoned office holder. I've only ever run for or held one office. It's the last one I'm going to hold. But I think I've got, after four and a half years, enough evidence to say you can talk to Americans as adults. You don't have to be afraid to do that. Now, when you're in the shape we're in right now, you, I have another um, conviction. That is, you've got to be prepared to take risk. In my misspent, misspent youth, I used to play a lot of pinball. And uh, uh, before it was digital. And when you're losing, 
And when the last ball is rolling right down the middle <laughs> toward the hole, there's only one thing you can do. You got to hit the table, yes. <laughs> and it might go tilt. But you got to take that chance that you may just di divert the ball enough to get back in the game. And that's where I think we are. And therefore, I don't, I don't, you know, truck with federal issues, but if I should occasionally get a question from a citizen about Social Security or Medicare, I tell them without hesitation, why should we pay for Warren Buffett's retirement? Why should we pay for Bill Gates' health care? Your kids, you and your kids cannot afford this, and we're going to have to change it, and I don't get a lot of pushback. But uh, you have to have, let's call it the audacity, I think, to to talk about that and so many other illustrations that I could give you. Finally, I think we must, recovery of credibility and eventually the trust to lead will require uh, in the near term that we accept with grace the role of the loyal opposition, which I believe is to, is to root sincerely for the nation's success and to express agreement where it exists so that your disagreements are more credible, and of course to leave partisanship at the proverbial shoreline. This of course means that we will have to conduct ourselves in opposition much more gracefully and much better than our opponents did. But we should be up to that. You know, our opponents, like, like, like my reactionary uh, uh, opponent colleagues in Indiana, will help us here if we'll let them. If, he, if you haven't noticed, although the stereotype has not yet changed, the meanest people in American politics are on the left, bar none. No conservative I know can hold a candle for sheer outright meanness, sometimes savagery. And of course that comes from believing that power is everything and uh, that winning is the only thing that matters, which we do not believe. And I guess this is my last point and I hope you won't find it uh, a banality. But I think we must be a friendly political movement. When some of us would get a little hot-headed, Ronald Reagan used to say, whoa, boys, remember, we have no enemies, only opponents. We are all Americans after all. And we must have deeply at heart the best interest of those Amer our fellow Americans, including those who, don't, who haven't made up their mind, who don't understand each of the Arthur's questions, and, um, and even those who disagree with us most strongly. The reason I don't think this is too trivial is that I do think it's faithful to the principles that drew many of us to this set of beliefs. To me, as a young person, not knowing really what I thought, when I look back, I believe I was drawn to the set of beliefs shared in this room by the, the single most attractive virtue of conservatism, which is its humility. We do not believe that we have all the answers. We do not believe a fallen human can. We do not believe that we are so smart and superior that we should order the lives and, and uh, all the affairs of our fellow citizens as our opponents do. I think it's, it's very easy to practice humility right now in the shape we're in. Uh, we'll have to practice another virtue, which is patience. We're going to have to spend some time in the penalty box. And uh, our fellow citizens are going to say, eventually we'll say, all right, we'll listen. Did you learn anything? Did you hear us? Do you have any new good ideas for us? And if we do, and we will, I have every confidence that freedom and those who espouse it cannot be kept down for long. Thank you very much.